So, was the Battle of Cape Esperance an unqualified victory? It was certainly a much needed boost for morale after the defeat of Savo Island. Um, there was a effective aerial reconnaissance by the B-17s and also by the cruiser float planes, something that had been absent in, in August. Scott engaged the enemy outside of, of Savo Sound. You remember Savo Sound was, a, it was created by uh, Savo Island, the Ingela Group, and Guadalcanal. Uh, it was subsequent battle, battles which occurred with inside the Sound. The, uh, they, were, the, they were limited by the, la the land mass. The fact that Scott engaged outside of the Sound meant that he was relatively unencumbered by the islands. He had a cohesive battle plan, which he communicated to his captains two full days before the battle. They had an opportunity to drill together on the 8th, uh, do gunnery and um, any aircraft practice. Scott succeeded in crossing the Japanese T, which was something that the Naval War College had determined in the 30s was never going to happen again. So what this was, this is a, this again is a reminiscent of a remnant of the Age of Sail, where a uh, a task a column of ships can fire its broadside against the enemy, who can only respond with its forward turrets. The SG radar worked as advertised. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, the SG radar has a range of about uh, 20 miles, and uh, the let's see what else. the SG the radar 20 miles. Jeff. Yeah. Why, why did man, I don't know if this is a proper time to ask her. Why did Scott turn off his radar? Well, there was also in 1942 na the Naval Intelligence had. Uh, believed that the Japanese had a detector, a radar detector, <laughs> and that the Japanese were actually could actually detect when there was a the meter wave radar signals. The reality was the Japanese didn't have anything like that. They didn't they didn't even have rudimentary radar until about this time, and, and it hadn't been deployed to the fleet. But the real I think the real reason was that um, Scott was uh, he was a he was a black shoe. Admiral. He was a he was a he belonged to the Gun Club, and the Gun Club believed that it was naval gunnery was going to be the arbiter of the na naval combat in World War II. And he was very suspicious of things that he didn't understand. He didn't understand radar. Uh, in fact, there was probably only one admiral in the South Pacific at that time who did understand radar, and he was in charge of the, uh, he was in command of the battleship Washington. His name was Willis Augustus Lee. So Scott was suspicious of radar. Uh, he was suspicious of radio. <laughs> he, had, he later said that he selected the column formation because uh, it, made, it uh, made communication between ships simpler. So he was a semi four. Uh, semi floor flags and uh, uh, blinker signals. <clears throat> okay, um, in one of the uh, one of the, the the big ship killer for the uh, for the during the Battle of Savo Island was fire. The three cruisers that were sunk at Savo Island, the Quincy, Vistoria, Astoria, and Vincennes, were uh, primarily destroyed because of. Uh, the flammable liquids in, that were contained in the cruiser float planes caught fire, and the conflagration caused uh, sank all three of the ships. So Scott had ordered, as I mentioned, he ordered his uh, cruiser float planes flown off, all but one, and so they, he flew those off. And then he ordered uh, all the flammable liquids jettisoned, the paint locker, all of that emptied. Um, one of the immediate changes after the, the battle at Savo Island was that um, Nimitz realized that years and years of peacetime sailing, that ships had layers and layers and layers of paint. They had battleship linoleum, they had wooden furniture, they had cotton mattresses and pillows. And uh, so right immediately after the, 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 the battle of Savo Island, uh, 
Nimitz ordered that all, everybody get out those paint chippers and they would start chipping off these layers and layers and layers of flammable paint. So um, no, there were no serious fires on board. There were actually no s significant damage. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about, um, about that in a second. Um, and the uh, Brooklyn class gun, uh, the Brooklyn class cruisers, which was the Helena and the Boise, um, had very impressive rates of fire. They had five turrets, three guns per turret, 15 guns. Each good gun could fire one round about in about uh, 30 seconds. So that's one 30 round uh, broadside per minute per, per cruiser. Pretty impressive. In fact, uh, Admiral Halsey, the hyper aggressive Halsey, uh, ordered that the um, continuous fire be the modus operandi for the Pacific Fleet, as opposed to, you know, the way it had been done in the past was that you, you shot a, a, a salvo and you saw where it splashed, and then you adjusted your fire and you shot another one. <clears throat> So, what didn't go so well? <laughs> it was far from flawless. <clears throat> Radar and radio communications, not so good. Boy, um, Helena should have reported that its radar contract immediately. Boise should not have, um, uh, should not have used uh, relative be uh, bearings and used the word uh, bogey to describe a, a surface contact. Those things were, re uh, were remedied very quickly uh, and almost immediately. Uh, Commander, to uh, Commander Tobin in his after action report suggested that the word skunk be used to describe a uh, unidentified surface contact. And then all, or Nimitz ordered that all, uh, bear all bearings be given in, in uh, magnetic. Uh, fire distribution was proving to be a um, a problem with radar directed gunnery. So these radar, the ra radar operators would uh, fixate on the nearest and largest ta uh, targets, and subsequently, the all the, sh the ships pounded Fabuki into the sea, and also Furutaka, but Aoba, Kinugasa, and Hatsuyuki escaped relatively unscathed because they were more distant they were not as big a blip on the radar screens. The botched turn pointed out what uh, Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner said about scratch teams. Scratch teams do not perform well in stressful situations. Uh, Nimitz's remedy for that was training, 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 training. Uh, they outlawed, Nimitz outlawed the use of searchlights at night. I think I, I forgot to mention that the Boise at a little bit before midnight inexplicably turned its, on its searchlight. And so in the same way that Aoba was a beacon to the Americans, Boise's searchlight was a, was a beacon to the Japanese. The Boise was hit um, by three, a three-gun salvo from uh, Furutaka. One of the shells actually penetrated the forward magazine below the waterline, but the fact that it was below the waterline, the, the water which poured in put out the fire that would have last, you know, resulted in a ca catastrophic explosion. Um, but really the first three, the, the front forward turrets of the ship were, were actually knocked out. And uh, Boise was out of the war for, for six months. Actually, I actually had to go back to the United States. Uh, Captain um, Iron Mike Moran was, was censured by uh, Admiral King for, uh, for using, for using uh, his searchlights. And also, that resulted in the, the Salt Lake City's only damage that night, too, because in the same way that Furutaka intervened on its flagship, um, uh, Captain Small, Ernest Small of the Salt Lake City, intervened between the Japanese and Boise, saving Boise, but also taking, uh, I think it was uh, some three, I think three, three six inch shell hits. Scott was uh, criticized for his choice of flagship. Apparently, the San Francisco ha had once transported um, Roosevelt to to England, so it had a really nice admiral's quarters. 
it did not have uh, it, it did not have the newest SG radar. It, and in fact, the, ne just now it was just uh, at this point in 1942, the new ships coming into to the Pacific Fleet were were outfitted with SG radar. Scott was criticized for using the. The column formation, again, seems kind of antiquated, <laughs> the way things used to be done. Uh, but more, more, more uh, concerning to Nimitz than the formation was the fact that his destroyers were separated, beginning at the end of the column, and they were tied to the column. You know, Scott in his battle plan said that the destroyers are going to screen the cruisers. They are not going to be an independent maneuver unit, which we'll get to talk a little bit more about here in a second. There was no way to identify friend from foe on your radar screen. Everybody looked the same. Um, and in fact, Boise was, had a, uh, found Duncan on its radar screen. And most of the damage that sank the Duncan was from the Boise and a few from the Helena. They know that because of the, the holes in the side of the Duncan were on the wrong side. They weren't on the Japanese side. <laughs> they were on the American side. Friendly fire. Friendly fire. And the other thing too was that uh, uh, they use die markers in the shells because as I mentioned, you know, the, the way that you do it is you launch a shell, it splashes, you look at it, see where it landed, you look at the color, so they could tell by the uh, color of the die markers on the, the Duncan's hits that it was from the Boise. And in general, this just revealed the, the, the Navy's need to develop a, more, a better night fighting doctrine. Scott, to his credit, made it up as he went along. You know, this was the first time that, for example, that radar was used uh, to make tactical decisions. He, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he, was, he was making up as he went along and he did, did a fairly good job. But Nimitz's biggest uh, criticism was that his commanders continued to focus on naval gunfire, the gun club, ignoring the offensive potential of their destroyers. What we were learning from the Japanese the hard way was that it was the, the torpedo, the surface launch torpedo, was the killing weapon of World War II. And uh, Nimitz's criticism here would not be addressed until the fall of 1943. So there was still a lot of learning to get done. You know, that a friend of mine, uh, Jack Gerwitty, was an ensign in these battles. And his dad commanded one of the, the destroyer squadrons, and in one of them, his, his dad wanted to make a counterattack, and I can't remember which battle, but it's one of these in here. He wanted to do a counterattack at night with the destroyers to do a uh, torpedo run. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was denied by the, again, again, I'm not sure which engagement it was. Right. But the, there were people there that knew what to do, mm -hmm. but the older guys weren't letting them do it. Well, you know, you remember where the Duncan? Uh, yeah. The Duncan wasn't in line with the, with its flagship Fahrenheit, right. and it was out of column because it had actually it actually saw Furutaka, and it was attempting to make an independent torpedo yeah, run. Yeah. And because of the qual the American torpedoes um, at the time, there were significant issues <laughs> yeah. with the torpedoes. And so Captain, uh, Commander Edmund Taylor, who was the commander of the Duncan, felt that he had to get within 2,000 yards of the enemy before, if he had any chance of hitting them at all. So uh, he took it without permission from Scott or even without notifying his uh, destroyer uh, squadron commander, he took the Duncan out of column and, or and initiated attack, an attack. Yeah? Were any of the other ships held accountable like legally for having friendly fire? No. no, not in those days. No, not in those days. No. You know, what was interesting, though, was that uh, when the Duncan survivors, when they were finally rescued and uh, they were sent back to the United States, they had to go back to the United States on the Boise. <laughs> the Boise's captain, as I mentioned, Iron Mike Moran, had painted six Japanese flags on the superstructure of the Boise. So he took credit for all six of the ships he thought were sunk, <laughs> and he took the, the Duncan survivors back to the United States in the ship that had sunk them. 
Did they, did they ever, uh, in time during World War II, did they ever uh, rectify that IFF situation? The aircraft have squawk codes and all that stuff in it and, and so forth, but did, did the ships... Did yeah, they, they did with, uh, they did with, air, with, uh, with aircraft. They did with aircraft. Um, the 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 issue with the, the there were there were there were very few friendly fire incidents after that in yeah. terms of ship ship v ship. The you know they they obviously they tightened up the the communication. They tightened up the radar. Um, in early 1943, they developed what was called the CIC, the Combat Information Center, which was a command center that was separate from the bridge. Was the, the, and that and that uh, really integrated all of the all of the messaging that was coming in the radio traffic the the radar you know so it was that the CIC and there was a CIC in each one of the new modern warships so they just they just tightened up the communications and that the the uh, night fighting doctrine improved uh, people knew where the other ships were going to be when they and when they were going to be there so those there were fewer those sort of things. Although I'm sure they ha I'm sure they happened. I mean, yeah. So was was uh, was the uh, Battle of Cape Esperance an unqualified victory? Well, um, I don't think that it was. I think first of all that the margin of victory was not two cruisers and five destroyers, as the Scots captains had initially thought. It was just a cruiser, the uh, Furutaka. And Scots victory had more to do with the, what, what the Japanese didn't do than what Scott did. First of all, uh, the Japanese Goto, the, the uh, Japanese Admiral, never expected to run into the United States Navy. They had not asserted any sort of, con tried to assert any sort of control at night in Guadalcanal at all. He received a message from um, you know, Goto got a word, got word from the the, the Japanese on the island that their the, the Savo Sound was free of Allied shipping, and he didn't know where uh, Joshima was, and that was that, that was the big thing. There, that seven minutes that he delayed fire because he thought he was being attacked by friendly forces. That's what did him in. Um, this battle perpetuated the reliance on guns. That was a, uh, and, and arrested the development of offensive torpedo doctrine, which we know wasn't really addressed until uh, the later parts of the uh, the uh, New Georgia campaign in, in uh, uh, the following winter of 1943. Okay, so as I alluded to earlier, in the, uh, Admiral Scott did not survive the war. He didn't even survive the month of November, 1942. <laughs> uh, on the 12th of, uh, 13th of November, Admiral Scott was aboard the light cruiser Atlanta, and in a task force which he, the victor of Cape Esperance, was not in command. In command of this task force was Admiral Daniel J. Callahan, who until a few days before had been Admiral Gormley's chief of staff. Before that, he was, had been uh, Roosevelt's uh, naval attache. Uh, Callahan had never commanded ships in battle, but he outranked Scott by three days. <clears throat> Therefore, he was put in command of this task force. There was a particularly noxious um, Tokyo Express that night. The Tokyo Express had battleship guns. It had two Haruna-class battleships in it. It intended to go and, and put, uh, it put uh, Henderson Field out of action. The Japanese knew they were there. Callahan was in column with his destroyers in front, destroyers in back. Wait for it. Flagship was San Francisco. <laughs> The one, the one of the few ships with the new SG radar, the, ha the Helena, was the last cruiser in the column. The column had 13 ships. It was 13 miles long, and it was trying to steam within the confines of Savo Sound. Scott, uh, I'm sorry, Callahan uh, got the mess initial 
radar contact from Helena about the Japanese uh, uh, formation. He, because he did not have, uh, because his flagship did not have radar or S, S, G, uh, the SG radar, he relied on Helena as a seeing eye dog. As the battle began to unfold, these two these two columns are, are, are closing at one another at tremendous speed. The the talk between ships radio circuits become overwhelmed. Uh, Callahan can't get the information that he needs, uh, and these two columns actually collide with one another. The, one of the sailors on board San Francisco described it as uh, a barroom brawl with the lights turned out. Literally ships intermingled at uh, ranges uh, even shorter than the ones that had uh, the ranges at the Battle of Cape Esperance. At one point uh, the Atlanta becomes disabled and drifts into the line of fire between San Francisco and one of the Japanese um, battleships. Uh, Callahan has already been killed. The San Francisco superstructure received a direct hit from one of the battleships, 14 inch. Uh, San Francisco uh, hits the, uh, the flag bridge of the Atlanta and kills uh, Scott and all of his staff and um, they're only, actually only able to identify Scott because they found his right arm and his Annapolis class ring. And um, did I mention November the 13th in 1942 was a Friday. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, who gave out the infamous order of even ships fire to port? That, yeah, that was Callahan. That was Callahan. That was Callahan. At that point, at that point, he had completely lost control. He had lost control of the battle, and his ships were intermingling. And he uh, he said, "What, what was it? I think it was even, even ships, ships to port, port, odd ships fired to starboard, or right? Which something like that. made absolutely no. Which yeah. was an order that made absolutely no sense to to ships that were actually currently engaged with other warships." <laughs> Yeah, that was Callahan, and yeah, you know, and Scott was was ordered uh, was uh, given um, a um, a medal of honor, and so was Callahan. But Admiral Pye, who was the president of the Naval War College, had s said that if Callahan had survived, he should have been court-martialed. <clears throat> so, anyway, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Hi. The B-17 spotted that initially spotted that column coming up. Mm -hmm. What? But but eventually said there's only one or two ships made up. Where did the other ones? Do? Good where question. Did, the other go? yes, good question. The other um, ships were were unloading elsewhere on oh, on okay. Guadalcanal. Oh, so okay. and they were actually in Taivu Point and um, at Cape Esperance, which were the 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 uh, the inlets that were supposed to be reconnoitered by the uh, Salt Lake City float plane which crashed and by the Boise or the uh, Helena float plane which never launched. So if those planes had, had flown in, they put aside and Did they do anything to interdict the, uh, the soldiers getting on the, on the island? Well, <laughs> another reason why the Battle of Cape Esperance wasn't as decisive as you know you think is that it never really changed the that it never really changed the situation in that you know the Japanese still uh, were able to have, to do what they will at night, but during the day the Americans took back over. But so what happened two days after or two nights after the Battle of Cape Esperance? The Marine on the 14th of October, the Marines called the bombardment. <clears throat> that uh, Scott after his uh, after the that, right? mm -hmm. uh, that was that was November 15th. That was a that was a different. No, the the bombardment was actually after the Battle of Cape Esperance, and Scott licks, is licking his wounds. He collects his ships, and they go back to sing uh, to Espiritu Santo. Another Japanese, a Tokyo Express, two nights later goes in with battleship guns, the Haruna and the uh, Congo, and completely laid waste to Henderson Field. They, they destroyed 21 aircraft. 
They killed 44 Marines, and they put so many holes in the in the in the in the uh, runway that Henderson Field is knocked out for weeks. And for a period of two weeks, the Japanese, because they don't have to, they're they're, they're not afraid of. Uh, the planes from Henderson Field are actually reinforcing their troops during the day. The Marines are sitting, uh, looking across the Matanakau River, and they're seeing Japanese transports disgorging, you know, hundreds and hundreds of troops. And it's at that point that General Vandergriff starts thinking about, well, what are we going to, you know, what what happens? They start talking about surrender, or they start planning for it. How? how they're going to disperse into the jungle and they're going to fight guerrilla. Uh, so at that point, it, the, it, the question was still very much in doubt. Let me get, let me get, yeah. uh, Hi, Jeff. Uh, yeah, is your main uh, focus and expertise on World War II campaigns or do you have others? Uh, well, I'm, I'm interested in, my, my master's degree is in American military history. <clears throat> My uh, master's thesis was on the development of offensive torpedo tactics <laughs> in, in the South Pacific. So my general area of interest is this second campaign of the Pacific War, August 1942 to November 1943. But yeah, I, um, I have, a, I have a, a, a YouTube channel, Military History Chronicles. Uh, I also have a blog, Jeff Ballard Online. And I love, you know, I love to talk about military history. All and I thank you, General, for your sure. presentation. Uh, uh, and both Ryan and I were very, we learned, have learned so very much today. We get Soviet cavalry next year. Okay, great. Because <laughs> that's European theater. That's something I know, I, I know very little about. But I'm looking forward to. It. Good job. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Good. Last question. Yeah. So, do the admirals always get it right when they do the after action report? And could oh, could he have no. looked at maybe because uh, the destroyers didn't seem like in the front that that turned incorrectly and were operating yeah. independently? It seems like they could have done something uh, to harass the landing operations. Or even the tailing destroyers, mm -hmm. but just to designate, you know, the commander during the action to right. designate something to help the Marines. Yeah, well, Scott could have, you know, he pursued, he broke off pursuit. A lot of people say a little bit too early, but he this the he still didn't know where those other ships were. You know, he his 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 float plane had spotted the one large and and two small, but he didn't know where the other ships were. So. He thought it better. He, you know, Boise was injured. It was trailing. You know, was headed off in a, in, in a different direction. His uh, ships were scattered. It was going to take hours for him to collect his uh, his force. And last thing you want to do is get bushwhacked. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But no, the the in the after action reports, it was very much of a CYA exercise. Yeah. You know, um, like the the you can imagine that the Duncan's commander. Had to, he had to write, he had to do some really creative writing <laughs> to explain why his ship was so far out of column when he hadn't been given permission to launch a torpedo attack. And, you know, what, what do you mean you got, you know, what do you mean you got hit by friendly fire? That, so, yeah. The, and, and, and even historians, you know, to the general's point, historians don't get to write either. You know, they're like probably the biggest question mark uh, about Cape Esperance was what what caught why did the bot why would the column turn why was that botched mm -hmm. and so you know you depending on the histor the historians that you ask <clears throat> you're going to get a different answer uh, uh, Admiral Elliot uh, Samuel Elliot Morrison who was like the premier historian of naval war in the Pacific in, in World War II he blamed it on the um, the helmsman on the San Francisco but he was an admiral, and he knew Scott, and he wasn't going to, you know, yep. the admiral was not going <laughs> to criticize an admiral. So Bring Elliot on. said, Elliot, Samuel L. Morrison said that it was, the, it, was, it was the helmsman on the San Francisco that didn't understand the, the order and made the turn. Uh, uh, Robert Fowler, who wrote a book, his, Robert Fowler was the grandson of the torpedo officer of the Duncan, wrote a book called The Gun Club at Cape Esperance. And he says that uh, that um, Tobin, the destroyer commander, says he didn't receive the message to turn. 
to make the turn because the TBS radio wasn't working. But if you remember, a minute later, he was on the TBS radio explaining to Scott why he wasn't, in, why he wasn't at the lead of the column. So that argument's a little <laughs> specious. <clears throat> and, but probably, <clears throat> probably the most likely explanation is, look at Scott's order. This is uh, Commander Task Force, execute the follow. 30 seconds later, left to course 230, execute. Make sense? Well, there's something missing right here. In the parlance of the naval communications at the time, there's, he should have said, if he wanted them to make a column turn, he should have said, turn left to course 230. If he intended them to make a simultaneous turn, he would have said, and don't ask me why, Corbin left to 230, in which case every ship would have turned simultaneously. So a lot of the, the uh, uh, Tobin and some of the other destroyer commanders said, well, we didn't know what kind of turn he meant. He didn't say. But he also said in his battle plan, he it's explicitly in the battle plan, I will never order a simultaneous turn in battle. There was just too much, uh, too much ambiguity, too, too many possibilities. Possibility. <laughs> Going on. Too much going on. Yeah. Great. Thank you.